Hi, my name is John Muppet and I'm a paediatric haematologist in Bristol. I'm also the lead investigator in the UK for the Altogether trial. I'm going to try to explain this trial to you guys today. Uh, I hope it goes well and do feel free to ask questions. I'm very sorry that I can't be there with you today. So before we talk about the trial, we need to spend a little bit about acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. So leukaemias are the commonest childhood cancer. And 80% of all childhood leukemia is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, called ALL for short. Now, before I spend a lot of time talking about a trial and how we're trying to improve things, I do want to reassure you all, if you look at this little chart on the right, the outcomes for childhood ALL are really very good already, with the vast majority of children cured long-term of their disease. I want to take you back briefly in history now, because this is a good marker point for where we're going to go in this talk. Back in the 1980s in the UK we ran a trial called UCAL8. Um, this had a very simple chemotherapy structure with three drugs used in the initial phase, vincristine, a steroid called prednisolone and a drug called asparaginase. Then patients had their cranial nerve system treated with uh, some chemotherapy given into the spine and radiotherapy and they carried on with what we call maintenance chemotherapy with just two drugs uh, for two years with the addition of some vincristine and prednisolone uh, shots once a month. This study in 1980 cured about 50% of patients. For that 50%, of course, that's great. For the 50% who couldn't be cured, that was awful. But what I want to note now is that the treatment that could cure half of the patients back in the 80s is less than 50% of what we would currently give to most patients. Also, all these treatments were delivered at that point in what we would now consider suboptimal ways. So the point is this, we can cure at least half the children with this disease with much less therapy than we use today, particularly if we use it well, like we hope we do today. So since the 1980s, things have evolved a bit, and this shows you kind of a diagrammatic structure of what treatment looks like. There's an induction block, then we have various blocks of more consolidative chemotherapy, along with maintenance chemotherapy, which runs from roughly two to three years. And these have been shown to be beneficial, but otherwise the treatment is very similar to how it was in the 80s. Now, really important step that we've taken since the 80s is to gradually increase the outcome of treatment increase the number of children who are cured over time, which is absolutely brilliant. This takes you up to about 2000 and I could show you graphs that go further and further up. But the way we did this was largely by adding blocks and blocks and blocks of treatment to that backbone that we had in 1980. The consequence of that is this. There are all these patients down here who were cured back in 1980, where given that we've just added therapy to what they would have already had in 1980, are being over-treated. They're getting too much treatment. They don't need all of that treatment. Equally, there still remains, unfortunately, a small group of children who we cannot currently cure. You might say that they're being under-treated and they need something else to help them to be cured, leaving roughly 30% or so of the patients that we currently treat who benefited from the increase in therapy from the 1980 backbone up to what we currently give today. And that represents the key problem that we face is working out how to solve this conundrum, that there are patients who are getting too little therapy and patients who are getting too much therapy. Unfortunately, one of the potential consequences of too much therapy is called treatment related mortality. This is where unfortunately, patients die as a result of over treatment. This is usually from infection, but occasionally from bleeding, from clots or from other drug side effects. Here's a study from the uh, Scandinavian group called NOFO, which looks over time at their studies. And on the left, you can see that over time from an early study in blue down to the most recent study in black, the number of deaths from disease has reduced quite significantly over time. Each serial trial reduced the number of deaths from disease. However, at exactly the same time, the numbers of children dying from treatment has not changed at all. And it's come to the point where these two are approximately equal. 
so that in a given treatment strategy we use now, about as many children will die as a result of the treatment, largely from infection, as they will from the disease that we fail to cure. It's not only, though it's very important, it's not only about death from treatment, it's also about toxicity. So here's another study that the NOFO ran, where they compared, this is just an example drug, they compared eight versus 15 doses of the drug called asparaginase that you saw in that 1980 protocol. You can see on the left that the outcome for the patients was essentially identical. So 15 doses didn't help, it didn't make things any better than already getting eight doses. But if you look over here, this is just a cumulative score of toxicity, all kinds of things that were toxic to the patients. The toxicity of 15 doses was around about twice as much as the eight doses. So what we learned from this is that sometimes extra therapy is not beneficial and in fact is harmful. And now we have indeed reduced the amount of asparaginase we use. So how do we work out who can get less therapy and who needs more therapy? So there are two or three main factors. The first one is this. This is the genetics of your disease. So we know that ALL, though it's the name for a disease that we kind of treat as one thing, is actually made up of lots of different genetic kinds and genetic causes for the same clinical disease. And we can work out what these genetics mean. And if you break them up into uh, various different groups, you can see that the outcome depends on the genetics. So here we found a group which is called high risk, which is the group that does worst. And this is just down to the genetics of the disease. And the genetics of the disease determines things like whether it's resistant to the treatments we give and how, how well the cells can grow and all those kind of things. So that's one thing that affects uh, how you might do. The second one is this, it's a test called uh, MRD, Minimal or Measurable Residual Disease. And this essentially measures how well the disease is responding to the initial therapy. This is from years ago, uh, from a German group actually, but they split patients up based on how quickly the disease had gone away, uh, a couple of time points. And you can see here the blue curve at the top, patients where the disease had gone away really, really quickly and very well, had an absolutely excellent outcome with hardly anybody relapsing. Whereas these patients on the black line where the disease hadn't responded well, uh, it really quite often came back. Now things have moved on since then, but this test is still very useful to distinguish those who are doing well and those who are doing less well. We've used this, of course. Uh, this is data from our last but one trial showing when we took patients with low levels of disease, so a good signal on that MRD test, and we took away some therapy and we did it completely successfully and their outcome was identical. At the same time, we used that test to identify patients who were doing less well. We gave them a bit more therapy and they did better. So we can use that test to do what we want to do, to take therapy down for those who are doing best and increase therapy for those we think aren't going to do so well. So that leads me to this. When we get to our trial, which I'll talk about in just a minute, we use three things to determine which patients are kind of gonna go which way. We use this MRD test, the response to treatment test. We use the genetics of the disease and we use some clinical features like age and whether there's disease in there in the CSF fluid uh, to decide what kind of risk they've got of the disease coming back. And we use that to judge how much treatment they should get. So coming now to the trial, what do we want from this trial? It's a new protocol and we had to think about this. What do we want to do? Well, obviously we want to cure the remaining patients who currently still die of largely relapsed ALL. These patients are the ones who are under treated and we want to give them more aggressive experimental therapy. At the same time, we want to de-intensify therapy for those patients who we think are over-treated and reduce that toxicity that I've shown you about. As part of that, we believe there's a group of patients where we can use a very targeted therapy uh, called imatinib uh, to help their therapy. Also, we want to use the power of the most novel immune therapies called CAR T cells for these highest risk patients where available. And underneath this all, we want to get the patients in the right places. So we wanted to improve the stratification and optimize therapy for all patients across the board. One of the things we're doing with that is measuring this asparaginase drug. It's quite a tricky drug to use. And we're trying to measure exactly what levels we're achieving to see if we can optimize the way we use that drug. So this is where we are. To answer all those questions, we needed a very 
big group of patients and a very big group of clinicians and clinical groups. So in orange, you can see the countries that are taking part in this trial. It's, a, it's about half the population of Western Europe. Uh, the Spanish will be joining us too. So there's a base population of roughly 200 million people here, uh, which means that there'll be about 1400 children and young adults per year recruited onto this trial when it's fully open. The trial is open for patients up to age 45 in some parts of the, of, of, the, of the consortium. In the UK, that's just going up to 29 at the first instance. Okay, so it does include some younger adults in the UK. The first thing we had to do was uh, design our trial. Because all these groups have been running their own trials for many years, we had to come together and agree what it would look like. And so we did a large piece of work between the Scandinavians, ourselves, a the Dutch group, a German group, and a Belgian and French group, and we joined our protocols together. Now, what I want to show you is one more slide here, which I want to really reassure you that we've that we've made it essentially we've created a new protocol, that it is a good protocol to use. Because if you look back, although our protocols were a little bit different to each other, in all these years, the outcomes were identical. What this says is essentially there is more than one way to skin this cat, that you can treat ALL slightly differently, use one drug a slightly different way to another in a different country, and you get the same outcome. So although there are subtle differences in the altogether protocol, in the kind of the baseline basic chemotherapy in this protocol from our previous one in the UK, people should not be worried about that because it's elements from these other trials, all of which gave the same outcomes. So essentially, we believe that we've taken the very best from all these different groups and combined it into our backbone therapy for this trial. This is what the backbone looks like. There's a block of chemotherapy called induction, then the second block called consolidation, a third block called interim maintenance, then this delayed intensification block, often a second interim maintenance, and then maintenance chemotherapy. And you'll see a little bit of that as I get into the talk. This is the trial design. It is a very complicated trial. This is a disease with many different subgroups in it, and you and we're asking many more than one question at the same time. But it goes like this. Essentially, the patient is diagnosed, and we perform important clinical diagnostics on them, which help us with that stratification. We give them some initial chemotherapy, and that gives us these MRD results at what we call time point one at the end of that induction block, and also at time point two, the end of the first consolidation block. And those facts enable us to work out what kind of therapy the patient should be given. Those patients with the, the, the disease that we think is the easiest to treat, they get more gentle backbone chemotherapy. Those with the disease that's a bit more difficult to treat, they get more intensified backbone chemotherapy. We call this risk stratification and we break the patients up into essentially four groups, a standard risk group, the intermediate low group, the intermediate high group and the high risk group. And we ask different questions for all these patients. For the standard and the intermediate low groups, we're asking de-escalation questions. We're asking whether we can take out bits of chemotherapy and reduce the side effects we get whilst maintaining the excellent survivals that we currently have. For the intermediate high group, we're asking a question about adding in a chemotherapy drug to see if we can improve outcomes. Then there are a few very special groups. For the very highest risk group of patients, they are being selected for a separate trial of, the, of CAR T therapy, which I'll explain again in a bit. For a very specific and small group of patients with a very specific uh, genetic abnormality, we're giving them a very special drug which is targeted directly at their therapy. And finally, for patients with Down syndrome, we've got another special intervention with a targeted agent called blinitumab. So that's the overall view of the trial. I'm now going to break down each of those elements in turn. For the standard risk patients, we're looking at removing therapy. So the drug we're trying to take out is a drug called doxorubicin, which we're taking out in this DI block. Doxorubicin is an anthracycline. Anthracyclines can cause heart damage, and they can certainly add to the infectious complications of treatment. So we believe that taking these drugs out would be really helpful in terms of outcome. Hopefully patients will have the same outcome, but less toxicity. For the intermediate low group, we're asking essentially the same question on a slightly stronger chemotherapy backbone. Um, we're asking whether we can take the doxorubicin out, but these patients have also got these, what we call pulses 
of vincristine and steroid still in their maintenance chemotherapy, and we're asking whether those can be removed. For the intensification for the uh, IR high group, which we call R3, we're asking about this drug called inotuzumab. Inotuzumab is a very special medicine. It's an antibody targeted against a, a, a molecule on the surface of B cells called CD22. This antibody sticks on and it carries with it a very nasty poison called calichiomycin. It goes inside the cells and kills them. So we're asking whether this targeted poison essentially can help kill these cells. We've got a good model to work on. There's a drug called Myelotarg, which we use in acute myeloid leukemia, which is exactly the same poison attached to a different antibody that sticks to myeloid cells rather than lymphoid cells. We know that that drug Myelotarg can work well in AML, and there's good reason to believe it might work well in ALL. There have been very promising results in early studies in relapsed and refractory patients. So we're taking it into this treatment, into this first line treatment now. So that's what this looks like. Essentially, they get standard chemotherapy all the way through to quite near the end of the, all the intensive bits, and they get this block of inotuzumab added before their maintenance chemotherapy. Now, this little group called able class fusions. This is a group of patients who've got a very specific genetic defect. They're quite rare, only about 3% of our patients. But as you can see here, this is the risk of relapse. Their risk of relapse is higher than other patients. And because of that, their outcome is less good. But we believe that these ABLE class patients are very similar to a different, slightly different form of leukemia called Philadelphia positive ALL. And if you look here on the left, this therapy, this disease used to have a very poor outcome along the blue line. But then quite a few years ago now, uh, we added a drug called imatinib, which is the gold line, which radically improved treatment for these patients. Now, these able class patients have got very similar defect in their cells to these Philadelphia positive patients. So we are adding this drug to their treatment and hopefully we'll get a similarly good response as we did in Philadelphia positive ALL. So this is what it looks like. Basically, we identify these patients very early on with that genetic testing and then we add the, uh, the, the imatinib, it's called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. We add it a little bit earlier for younger patients and then it goes on all the way through their therapy. Now, CAR-T therapy. You may well have heard different talks about this before, so I'm not gonna go into the great length, but CAR-T therapy is where you take the patient's own T cells, you take them out, you put them in the lab, and you essentially teach them to attack B cells. So you put this, what's called a chimeric antigen receptor into them, which attacks uh, a molecule on the surface of B cells, and essentially teaches your own immune system to kill your own B cells. That's not generally a good idea, uh, killing off parts of your own, own immune system, but because the leukemia has got this on it, these cells kill the leukemia cells. And this has been shown really strongly to have a very good outcome. This is a study from uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia a few years ago now, showing that patients who've had multiple lines of therapy and failed them, so these are patients who really had no other chance of cure at all, really quite a lot of them can be cured with this treatment. So we're selecting patients who've got the, just the highest risk disease at all possible to go on to trial of this therapy. Finally, um, in terms of the interventions, just to mention blinatumumab, uh, this is a kind of, it's a bit like CAR T cells, but it's a drug. It basically, is a, it's here on here, and it's a clever drug that sticks your T cells to your B cells in this case. So instead of being you treat, te teaching the CAR T cells to do this, we force them to do this with this drug. And uh, we believe this does a kind of similar thing to those CAR T cells. There's good evidence that it could be very effective. We certainly know it's a very, very safe drug with very few toxicities. And so for Down syndrome patients uh, who particularly struggle with toxicity of therapy, and one of their biggest problems in Down syndrome is actually dying of infectious consequences of therapy, we're looking to give them blinatumumab instead of to replace some of their chemotherapy with blinatumumab. Finally, I just want to say this, the altogether study is so much more than just a clinical study. Whilst it is all those clinical studies I've described to you, there is also so much to learn about this disease. And so we're doing lots of other studies. For example, we're trying to learn more about CNS leukemia, how to measure it, how to work out which patients are at risk of relapsing in their CNS, that's this CSF flow study. We're looking at the toxicity treatment on the brain with a brain study. We're looking in this Cipropal study at whether prophylactic antibiotics help reduce the risk of infection. 
we constantly wanted to assess the quality of life of patients on our treatments to see which treatments affect them worst. And beyond this, there is lots and lots of what we call translational research, where we want to learn more about the biology of ALL, how it's caused, how you can potentially treat it better, and all those kind of things. And th these are being learnt on based of samples, which hopefully patients and their families will be willing to donate to this kind of research through our biobanking processes, which is currently through Cellbank. I hope this very swift run through the trial has been helpful for you. Um, I think it's a great study. It is a complex study with lots and lots of different studies embedded in it. Um, but for each patient working their way through, once we know which risk group they're in, it's a fairly clear pathway for an individual patient. So at the beginning, it can look very daunting, but as you get into it, it's a really very simple pathway that each individual patient will follow. Uh, do hope this has been helpful and have a great day.